Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the newest episode of Simi Pro. I'm your host, Dalton Barrett, but you may know me better as Barrett Digital. And in the studio with me, I've got my good friend... Real World of Flash, a.k.a. Eunice. What's up, guys? That's not right. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> and he's gone. Hi, I, uh, I'm Josh Clements, uh, or Barrett. I'm not Eunice, a.k.a. Real World of Flash. Uh... <laughs> We we had someone crash our podcast. <laughs> that was so stupid. <laughs> Why did we do that? <laughs> oh, no. Man, what are we talking about, Josh? What's going on here? Uh, well, we're talking about Twin Peaks, as we have been for the last three weeks. Uh, and it's sort of bittersweet, because um, this is probably the last Twin Peaks discussion that we will ever have in our lives, because Twin Peaks is over. Probably, maybe not, but probably. Who knows? Uh, to be fair, though, we also say that every week is going to be the last time we mention the Last Jedi, and we still manage to get it in there every single week of our lives. Okay, see, I've never said that. That's been you, and we still haven't done a dedicated Last Jedi discussion on the podcast, which is mildly upsetting. We just mention it so frequently. But yes, <laughs> this is uh, Twin Peaks: The Return or Twin Peaks Season Three, which is. Um, the third season of the show released 25 years after the first two. Right. There was a, a movie in between that we caught last week. If you want to check out the film show on that, if you want to check out the first two episodes of the podcast, we talk about season one and then we talk about season two. And then, like I said, we have a, a commentary track of um, Fire Walk With Me, which is the most awkward, horrifying, disgusting thing we've ever done. If you, uh, if you want to feel horribly depressed for two hours and watch three grown men have to watch and talk about multiple uh, sex scenes within a movie. Uh, yeah, check it out. I would go worse than sex scenes, but we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> I would just keep it light. <laughs> yeah. If you hate yourself, go and watch that film show. But I do want to talk about The Return, and this is the one I was the most excited to talk about, because while I love the the first two seasons of the show, I, let me rephrase, I love the first season of the show and half of the second season of the show, and I really like Fire Walk With Me, the movie, this is probably my favorite Twin Peaks. Um, and it came out about three years ago or so, uh, 2017, I guess it's been almost four now. But it, it's... It's it's different and weird, and we're gonna we're gonna get into it. Uh, we are gonna talk spoilers, but if you don't care about that or you've seen it, stick along for the ride. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I mean, as we said, I think on the other ones, it doesn't really matter if you know the spoilers because it's Twin Peaks, and even you can know everything about the series and still watch it and still have a great time. Uh, uh, let me rephrase: you won't know anything about the series even after you've watched it. And the, right, return, exactly. <laughs> the return makes that even more evident. Right. The, the, the return is the, probably the most abstract that it's ever gone. Like, like season one is pretty abstract, but it kind of rides the line. And then season two dips its toes into it. But this is just a full on. This is like you're drowning in the deep end and you're trying to get to the shallow end to save yourself. And then you go back into the deep end again. A fire walk with me is really dark. Um... Really dark, but it's mostly like... 99% of Firewall for me, it's, it's fine. It like it works in the world of realism, of just... It, it's it's more character-based than anything else. Right, yeah. that That's kind of uh, what I would argue. Um, but like, Twin Peaks in general is more sort of... It's got characters, and its characters have arcs, and they're very... Uh, they're something. They are characters that exist in a fictional movie and they, TV show. They are something else. Arguably not a fictional movie. But we'll get into that later. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, I want to break this down. If you want to get into the return, because it is more recent, it's newer, let's say you're not into the older stuff, you don't want to, you don't want to watch two seasons of a TV show just to watch this third season of the new show, which I would recommend watching a full sweep of Twin Peaks like we did for the podcast here. Necessary watching. Uh, I would argue, and I mentioned this last week on the commentary track, I would argue that Fire Walk With Me is much more necessary to understand this, uh, the return, than the original series is. Both are somewhat necessary watching, but I would argue that Fire Walk With Me is is more necessary to understand this. Yeah, well, okay. so... Uh, th I've watched the return sort of one and a half times. I, I watched half of it the first time I ever watched Twin Peaks. 
Uh, and during that first watch, I didn't watch Fight Walk With Me because it wasn't available uh, in the UK at the time. Uh, so I went into The Return just kind of knowing Twin Peaks 1 and 2. As a result, I missed out on so much to do with Fight Walk With Me, uh, particularly the character of Philip Jeffries, uh, and sort of uh, the struggles of, not the struggles, but like the internal conflicts of uh, the Black Lodge and Bob and the arm. <laughs> right. <and all> <laughs> uh, but... Yeah, like, you watch Firewalk to me, and then I watch The Return, and it just kind of clicked a bit more. Um, Yeah, I I would definitely agree. Uh, There's a lot of really interesting stuff to be said about The Return. Um, There is stuff in there for those classic Twin Peaks fans, but this was made for people who are, like, David Lynch fans and fans specifically of The uh, Firewalk with me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They they take the... um, and we'll talk about this a little later too. They take the 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 parody element of the original show basically out of it. Um, the because because Twin Peaks, if if you're not familiar, or didn't watch our other podcast about it. It's sort of this parody of um, the sitcoms, not sitcoms, the the soap, soap operas, operas that were yeah, on at yeah. the time. And uh, it does a really good job of that. This sort of completely drops that soap opera aspect of it and almost replaces it. Now, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this with like a... Like True a, detective vibe. Right. That's exactly what I was going to say. It, it almost feels like a, yeah, like a, yeah, definitely. A, a, a a cop show, which is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, well, it, it barely feels like a Twin Peaks show. Uh, like... like and when I say that, I don't mean it doesn't have the same atmosphere and vibe as Twin Peaks, because it absolutely does. But more just sort of, like, Twin Peaks Season 1 and 2 take place, I think, entirely within Twin Peaks. It's very rare they go outside of it. Other than uh, James. Other than, well, we don't talk about it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> other than that, like, it's all very based in the, the town of Twin Peaks, everything's sort of the characters who live in Twin Peaks. And this is more just sort of, Gordon Cole and Cooper, and then occasionally something cuts back to Twin Peaks, which you kind of get why towards the end, but like it's very detached from it. it. Every now and again, it cuts back to a character or the town or whatever, and you see like, oh, uh, Bobby's become a police officer, or oh, uh, Big Ed's still with Nadine. Like it, it, it goes. Dr. Jacoby has freaking lost his mind. <laughs> Dr. Jacoby is setting golden shovels in the woods. And he's got his own conservative-based podcast. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Jacoby was never really there in the first place, but he's somehow even further gone. And that's kind of... that's kind of The really interesting thing about, about this is it takes the things that you would expect from a, a revival series like this and just sort of completely gets rid of them. Yeah, well, um, it, does a, it does do the same thing that Twin Peaks originally set out to do and being both a parody and part of, like, right. a, 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 a genre, I suppose, or a sub-genre. Like, it, it, it still sets out to be a parody of True Detective while also giving into that kind of True Detective feel. Um, right. I more mean, like, like, when you think of a revival series... Um, any of the popular ones. You got like your Star Wars comes back and, and, and all these different series as they come back. There's always the big fan service moments like Han Solo steps into the Millennium Falcon for the first time. And nobody in this series really gets that outside of maybe Bobby kind of gets it. Yeah, um, a little bit. You cut to like, your- like when he sees Laura Palmer's photo uh, on the desk again. It like he has P- PTSD. <laughs> well, there's the scene where where they're walking down the hallway, and um, uh, Hawk, you know, says something to him, and he says, "Hey, we need you to come here for a second. And then it's like the slow turnaround, the 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 big reveal of who this cop walking down the hallway is, and turns out it's Bobby. But then you go to like Dr. Jacoby and it's just like a wide shot of him standing in a trailer <laughs> and, and all of the characters are, are, are done that way. Even um, Cooper, for the most part, there's another shot later on in the series that feels kind of fan servicey for him. Um, but for the most part, it's just everybody is just like 
it's just standard. It's none of the fan service and none of the none of the the big reveals of of who's in it, and you don't get any of those those moments. You do get the Laura Palmer thing, like you were saying with Bobby, but outside of that, and and Cooper at the end of the series, you don't really get any of those. Yeah, and you just kind of you, you, it just people just exist, which is something that's kind of great about Twin Peaks. Is it does deal it, nothing it ever deals with is like world ending. It's just kind of chaotic. And yet, it frames everything in this kind of idea of just stuff is happening and stuff is going to keep happening, uh, and it's just no one, no one is special, right? And it except like, everyone except one person, right? James, because James <laughs> is man in the world. James is so cool. James has always <laughs> been cool. Incredible. So let's kind of break this up uh, this way. We're going to talk the first half of season one, and then we will talk episode eight, and then we'll talk the second half. Uh, not season one. The first half of the season, episode eight, second half of the season. So let's kind of break it up that way, and let's kind of break down um, that first episode. The thing I kind of want to talk about is when we go to the roadhouse uh, for the first time in that episode, and Shelly looks at James and says, James is so cool. James has always been cool. Um, but you sort of see that this isn't the Twin Peaks that we left. Yeah, like James looks looks well. James always looks sad. <laughs> well, I'm not necessarily talking about James. I don't mean the Roadhouse in general. This doesn't feel like the same town. Things things feel more so. Things feel darker. They feel more depressing. Like in even in the original series where Shelley's with a man who beats her. <laughs> like she she's at work or she's out and she's still very upbeat and like happy. Right. Whether or not she's faking it, you know, that's up in the air, I suppose. But, like, yeah, then you see Shelly in this, and she just kind of tired. Yeah. Well, and everybody does. There's another scene that's a little later uh, in the... Because the series kind of builds on this as it goes. Uh, a little later in the season, there or there's, a, there's a clip from the Roadhouse, which almost every episode ends... Um, in the roadhouse with a musical number, and that's kind of how they show the atmosphere of what's going on in Twin Peaks. And there's this this lady, uh, this young woman who's sitting at a table, and these jocks just come up to her, and they ask her to leave very rudely, and she says, "No, I want to. I want to sit here." And so they physically pick her up out of the booth and sit her on the ground, and she just breaks down into tears. And starts crawling away into the crowd of people where the music is blaring so loud you can't hear her, so she just lets out a scream. And it's like little things like that just show us that Twin Peak, the, the, the positive influences in Twin Peaks, like your Dale Coopers or your Laura Palmers or whoever, those positive influences in this town are gone. So what happens to this town without a Dale Cooper there to protect it? Well, I mean, last time, last week, we saw Laura Palmer kind of pimping a friend out. <laughs> well, uh, yes. So, <laughs> but no, I get you're right in what you mean. It's like the goodness has gone from the town. Let's say it like uh, this: What happens when the Bookhouse Boys leave Twin Peaks? What? No, what happens when my man Harry leaves Twin Peaks? Because that's the real yeah. That's we why gotta it's downhill. We gotta talk about this. So Harry, uh, for whatever reason, the actor didn't want to come back. Um, so they, well, that's another thing that's kind of worth mentioning is that half, like over half the actors in this had retired by this point because they're all 90,000 years old. Uh, they're so but, old, yeah. man. I, I can't, I think it kind of speaks to the kind of person that David Lynch is, is that he'd ring them up and be like, Hey, I'm, I'm recording a new episode. <laughs> Can you come back? And they're like, yeah, sure. I'll come back for like a few episodes or whatever. And so a, a lot of people return, like Bid, uh, Big Ed, Nadine, uh, Dr. Jacoby, uh, Donna's father, she, he returns, even though he's literally 90,000 years old. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, and once again... The lock lady who passed away two years prior to cancer, unfortunately, she has a cameo in this, I guess you call it. I mean, she kind of plays into the plot, honestly, uh, which is awesome. Yeah. Um uh, back to Donna's father, Doctor whatever his name is. Uh, that scene with him was super heartfelt because um, they're they're really just talking, and I'm pretty sure David Lynch just got on a Skype call with this guy, read the lines, and recorded the screen of his computer. 
Um, cause that's what it is in the, in, in the actual series. He's just on a Skype call with this guy and it's, it's great to see little stuff like that. And, and all of the log lady scenes are filmed with her talking on the telephone with, uh, detective Hawk, which is super cool that, that David Lynch was able to have the foresight to record this just in case he ever makes this series. Um, right, yeah. I, I don't know when production began on it, uh, which is a good question that we should have probably looked up before. But uh, Yeah, but who cares? Yeah. Not, oh, Semi-Pro is not exactly known for its intense research. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Harry, uh, Harry S. Truman, the absolute Chad detective that he is, uh, does not return right. for this, but instead his brother, um, we'll just call him Sheriff Truman because I don't remember his first name because it's not as cool as Harry, uh, his brother it has it's taken over. by uh, Robert Forster, who, again, also unfortunately passed away, but he does a phenomenal job. So oh, he's he, great. When I picture the, the stuff that he has to deliver, the lines that he delivers in this, I can't picture Harry doing it. Um, honestly, I would argue, as much as I love Harry, I would argue that the, re- not recast, but the replacement was done for the better. As As sad as that is. Uh, it's um Frank, by the way, his name. Frank, yes, Frank, yeah, Frank but, Truman. But yeah, like he, he's wonderful too. Uh, yeah, like you said, Harry. They don't kill Harry off, which is nice. Like he right. don't, he, Harry doesn't die. He's just kind of sick. He's he's out of town, sick. So his brother's looking after everything, <laughs> which is just great. Um, because you think it'd be Hulk, you know, the man, the deputy who he'd been with in one of the Bookhouse Boys, <laughs> right? Uh, but no, he gives it to his brother or Big Ed. Deputize or, Big yeah, Ed. Big Ed. Give um, my boy big something to do. But yeah, it's like everyone's, everyone's, mostly everyone returns. Uh, uh, do, you, do you want to explain what the series is about? <laughs> but no, but I do want to talk about, <laughs> because I don't know. Um, I do want to talk for just a second about you, you, you brought up um, Harry being sick. And that sort of goes with this underlying theme throughout the series, specifically when we're in Twin Peaks. Kind of like along with what I was saying earlier about how it just doesn't feel the same. It doesn't feel like the same place. And there's this there's this underlying theme of sickness um, and disease, and, and there's a lot of other things throughout the series that, that sort of allude to sickness in Twin Peaks. And one of those being Harry, they make a, they make a point to say he's sick. They could have said he's on vacation. They could have said he, he died. They could have said he retired. Like, any of those things would have worked, but instead they went with... He's sick, and there's, uh, there's that one scene if you remember when the when the kid, uh, shoots through the window of the double R diner, um, and Bobby goes out to the car that is honking in traffic, and there's this woman, and she's just sitting there screaming in the car, this old fat woman, and she's just screaming and screaming, and she goes, "I gotta get her home. She's sick. She's sick." And then this kid, just like a zombie, raises up her arms leans forward and just vomits all over this woman. And it's just horribly disgusting, but it plays into this theme throughout the series of sickness. Make with that what you will. I don't know what to make of it. I just picked up on it. Um, so as we kind of keep going through this, we're in, we're introduced back to special agent Dale Cooper, but he never opens his mouth and he's stuck inside the black lodge and he's been there for, 25 years. Five years. We're also, over the course of this time, uh, reintroduced to the one-armed man, known as Mike. Um, and and he talks a little exposition. Uh, Lurch comes back for this, and we, we get to see the evolution of the arm. <laughs> um, for whatever reason, that actor didn't want to come back, so they replaced him with a tree with a brain on it. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That, I mean, why wouldn't you? Right. That's that's David Lynch for you. Um, but yeah, it was it was really neat to see the Black Lodge and 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 get to revisit that and whatever. And then that's pretty much episode one, right? We we're reintroduced to Twin Peaks. We get to see Cooper in the lodge, and then we that's that's basically it, right? I can't think of much else. Oh, um, we get to meet up back up with our our good friend Gordon Cole. Who my, he's the main character, isn't it? He's the closest thing you have to a main character in this series. I would argue that, yeah. I would say he is the main character of this series. Um, my favorite little 
tidbit about Gordon Cole in The Return is he's still wearing the 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 old fashioned hearing aids that he wore in the original, but now they're wireless, and he still clips the receiver to the to the suit coat pocket on his on the outside, and it's incredible. I love it so much. Also, I take it back. I would say Dougie Jones is the main character, but we'll get there when we get there. So that's basically how the first episode goes. It reintroduces us to Twin Peaks. It, it, you know, we get a look into the FBI. We get to explore that a little more than we have in the past. Um, we learn that things aren't quite right with Twin Peaks. Things are, are, are a bit off. Not the show, the town. Um, <laughs> and then we see Cooper in the Black Lodge. Oh, we're introduced to that one guy whose girlfriend keeps hitting on him in, the, um, in front of the, the big black box. Oh yes, yes we are. I, I don't. Rem- I don't remember his name. Um, I, I, I I don't know if he's given a name. I want to say Sam. Sam Raimi <laughs> is watching, <laughs> and, and, and it really doesn't matter because he's he, he's dead by the time episode two starts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's that's sort of the I guess the framework of episode one because it kind of opens on that, which once again, uh, a lot like Fire Walk with Me, seems to be very direct TV symbolism <laughs> about how much. <laughs> David Lynch hates working on TV, even though this is a is a show. Yeah, I I, I don't know. Okay, truth be told, like there's okay, so there's a lot of stuff in Twin Peaks that you can sort of read into as a metaphor, or you know, you can take as part of the show. And there's a good amount that you just don't know what is going on at all. And this is one of those situations where even on my second viewing, I was like, yeah, I just I don't know because this is what happens, right? This dude sits and stares at a box for 24 hours a day doing nothing else. And the box has nothing going on with it. And then one time he invites his girlfriend up there. They start having sex. Cooper appears in the box. The box breaks. And then the spirit of Cooper kills them in a very bloody fashion. Okay. And that's, they never talk about it again. That's not how I read it. Um, and the finale, <laughs> the finale reframed the whole thing. So I, that's a living translation. <laughs> well, because we don't see Cooper in the box. We just see a formless being. My sure. assumption was that was Judy. Because when they summon Judy at the end, when uh, Diana and or Diane and Cooper summon Judy in, in the finale of the show, they have sex. And that summons Judy. So that was my assumption. And we know Mr. C is the one, we find out later in the series, Mr. C is the one who built that box to trap Cooper when he comes back, but it wound up not working, or trap Judy because he was also hunting Judy throughout the season. So I assumed that was Judy who killed the two of them, not Cooper. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So there we go. But this, so, but it's, it's that big black box sitting there. They're sitting on a, on a living room couch watching this black box. It's very, very clearly just a television. Like that's, that's the, that's the symbolism David Lynch was trying to get across. But yes, so those two people die a horrible, horrible death. Um, and that's, that's sort of the first indication that this isn't your grandma's twin peaks. Um, I would say, (laughs) well, it's, it's, it's the first indication that David Lynch has a lot more freedom than he did in 1992. Right. It should be noted also that Mark Frost does come back for this, which yeah, I think David was Lynch the... David Lynch directed every episode, I think? Yes, he directed every episode, but Mark Frost uh, co-wrote the entire series with him, as opposed to Fire Walk With Me, which Mark Frost was absent from, uh, which led to that being a whole lot darker than this is, which this still gets pretty dark. Like I said, those people die a horrible, horrible death. And then we kind of bounce around from different locations from time to time. But I can't remember if it's episode two or episode three where we're introduced to who I'm going to call the main character of this series. A man by the name of Doug Douglas Jones. And Sir Douglas, uh, when we're introduced to him, he's got this long brown hair and he's uh, chubby and he's, he's hooking up with a prostitute in a house that he has rented. Um, and he passes out on the floor and at the point of passing out, Cooper, who has now served his time in the in the Black Lodge, because I guess that's how it works. Um, <laughs> it's been 25 years, and I guess he gets yeah, to yeah. go back. Yeah, the the arm is like, you must go, and he must be inside. Right. <laughs> so, Doug, Dougie Jones was a 
second it, doppelganger created by Mr. C. Mr. C. That inhabit essentially Bob in, in possessing Cooper's body. It's a doppelganger of Coop that Bob possesses, essentially. Right. So so the the Mr. C who's walking around is the Cooper that was in the finale of the season original two. Uh, season like two. How's it? Exactly. Who uh, was not real Coop, who it, it was a doppelganger of Coop created for Bob to possess. Yes. So and he, he has the most leathery skin. He's got the, the most leathery skin, man. They they and, do a really good job of making him look like Bob, but yes. he can only be in the doppelganger's body for twenty five years. That time is up. So a few years earlier, he creates another doppelganger of that body gives him his own personality and sets him out into the world named douglas jones yes. when he's, cooper he's not, like, he's not like bob levels of chaos but he's still not a good guy he cheats on his wife he gambles he gets into debt blah 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 blah, blah. right cooper um is about to re-inhabit um his original body uh, mr c's body there's a horrible car accident for whatever reason i wasn't really sure why Instead of going into Mr. C's body, he instead goes into Dougie Jones's body. Well, Mr. C vomits up a lot of black goo. Uh, <laughs> yes, that is true. I, I think I took it as Mr. C was legally dead for like a couple of minutes. And as such, Cooper couldn't possess a dead body. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, he, so he vomits up the black goo. He's still around. He's 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 on his mission. He, he's, it appears his mission is to... Um, de- defeat Judy because she's the only person in the world who's more evil than he is. That's yes. kind of the way I took his mission this year. Oh, it, 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 it's like the whole. Uh, so we see in a very special episode that Judy essentially births Bob. Correct. Uh, that she brings him into this world. I don't know. I just I took it more as like a parental thing because that's all like this show is. It's all about parents. Is it? Yeah, at least Laura, Laura's part is... Well, Laura and Donna's parts always seem to be about their parents. Right, yeah, okay. I could I could buy it. I think there's some kind of connection to that that I also didn't quite understand. I'm just like... With David Lynch, it's like... It's like looking through the fog and trying to see a town. And every now and again, you'd see one light pop on and then that light would go off for another five years. And you have to keep <laughs> trying to find it. It's like trying to find a village in Minecraft. It really um, is. You never know what you're looking for, really. Um, so, yeah. So, so that happens. Um, and and when Cooper inhabits Dougie Jones's body, um, he essentially... I, I don't even know that it's, he's inhabiting his body as much as that is Cooper. He just doesn't remember anything. He, he He's almost taken back to, like, a childlike state. Um where he doesn't know what is going on. So Stacy, the prostitute who he's with, uh, who gives two rides, by the way, (laughs) um, takes him back to the casino where they met, presumably, or where she works, I I guess. Um, Takes him back there, and Mr. Jackpots, as he comes to be known, wins just by sheer luck and, and, and Black Lodge magic, keeps winning jackpots. Over and over and over and over and over again, uh, and he takes all the money back to his wife, um, or I guess she comes and picks him up when he gets caught by security because they think he's cheating, uh, but they can't find any proof of it. His wife comes and picks him up and, and gets onto him for gambling, and then Dougie Jones, who doesn't know what he's doing, just yeah, okay. So Cooper as Dougie Jones basically has uh, the mind of a one-year-old, essentially. Uh, and that's quite a neat scene. I, uh, when when Cooper possesses Dougie Jones, it like it's not an exact recreation. Like his fingers shrink a little bit. He kind of he loses a bit of weight. He he morphs into how Coop was twenty five years ago. And it's just I don't know, it's a nice little touch to see that. Like you don't really. It, it's a nice visual confirmation of what's going on, which you very rarely get in your films. Right, right, right. Um. And so the money he won at the casino uh, turns out uh, to Mr. Jackpots. right. The money Mister Jackpots wins um, pays for the debt that him and his family are in, and that sort of sets us off on the the Dougie Jones 
storyline of this season, which is my personal favorite storyline of the whole season. Um, and we will talk about that a bit more, but we kind of need to shift back a little bit to Twin Peaks for a moment. <laughs> Just like the show. Right. <laughs> shift back. Well, that's what I meant. We need to shift back to the town of Twin Peaks for a moment, uh, where Hawk, uh, the log lady calls Hawk, who the log lady is a, a psychic woman who talks to her log, who may or may not be possessed by her dead husband. We're not really sure. No, um, no. She gives a, a phone call to to Deputy Hawk and starts talking about Cooper, um, and, and and at the same time Gordon and um, and his team, the Blue Rose team, sort of get on this. Uh, they're looking for Judy ultimately, but they sort of get derailed a bit uh, because of some evidence of of Cooper coming back, and they they want to find their their long lost teammate, and so that right. sort of sets up the the basic framework of the season, which does get completely derailed the further along we go, but that sets up the basic framework for how this season goes. Um, the blue Rose team goes and they pick up Diane who we've only heard in, in name only played excellently, excellently by Holdo agent Holdo. It's the yes. same character. I'm convinced. Uh, I don't, I don't, I, that's the it's only got thing. The right. Hair. right. Well, um, it, it makeshift. Is it Diane? Uh, that's the question. I mean, we haven't gotten there yet. We're only talking about the first half of the season, Josh. Right. We've talked about the first half of the season, and it's nearly thirty minutes. Right. Well, that's good. Now that now we can shift focus to episode eight, because, like I said, it, it's basically just that for for a lot of the season. It's it's Dougie Jones um, doing the Jar Jar Binks thing. Or we determined it, we should probably go with Mr. Magoo, because um, that probably created this trope. It's a trope that I hate. It's, like, it's, it's the earliest one I can think of, uh, and you you describe best. It's a trope that I hate, uh, and like I said, think Jar Jar Binks in Phantom Menace, where he keeps doing these, he keeps like messing things up, but when he messes things up, they turn out to be the right thing to do. Um, so for instance, Dougie Jones goes gambling, which is the wrong thing to do because his family's horribly in debt from his gambling, but then he wins enough money to pay off his debt. Little things like that, um, all over oh, he, the place. He also, when he goes gambling, he has little ghosts telling him which, which machines are going to hit the jackpot next. Yes. Uh, and there's that great moment where like, there's this old homeless woman who's also there and he sees her and she's like really curious, so he just points at like another one, and she goes and gets the jackpot. She's the one who <laughs> gives him the name Mr. Jackpots. Mr. Jackpots. Uh, yeah, and he just he goes around and he just repeats stuff that he heard. He he hears like he hears the machine say hello. He hears a guy yell hello as he uh, does a Mr. Jackpot. And so for the rest of the series, he just keeps yelling hello at people. <laughs> right, <laughs> and it's so great. Right, like I said, picture picture a one year old, and, and you've got you've got Dougie Dougie Jones, um, and, and it's it's a trope that I don't like, uh, um, ever really. I think it's really hard to do well, but this series does it so perfectly, and Dougie Jones is such a great, lovable goofball, um, that I didn't. I it's it's my best example of it in existence is Dougie Jones is uh, the the Mister Magoo, um, of it all. And he does a really great job. It's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah, you know, and he kind of, um, the real Dougie Jones, his relationship with his family isn't isn't great. Um, he doesn't have a, a great relationship with his wife or or his or his son. No. His son, no. Um, uh, like when his wife when his wife picks him up, and he, he says, "Stacy gives two bites," and she just goes. I'm sure he she does, honey. Well, that comes with with the blackmail photos that came in the mail of him with this prostitute. <laughs> um, yeah, he's also, he's also in debt to like uh, the mob who own the casino. I think. Yes, I think they they kind of. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't I, know. He's in debt to someone who blackmails him and tries to car bomb him. Right. Exactly. Um, I think the mob showing up at his house came later, uh, or showing right. up at Stacy's house came later. Uh, yes, yes. But it, there's a lot of that, and that's basically the season. Uh, Hawk and the 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 police officer at Twin Peak or Twin Peaks are are going on this, um, basically pulling the pulling the string until they can find 
Um, they're going on this wild goose chase for for Cooper just based off of what um, what the log lady told them, as well as some other stuff kind of happens in Twin Peaks that, that that's weird, and, and they're trying to get to the bottom of it. Um, most of the Twin Peaks stuff outside of the, the police is basically just wrapping up loose ends from the series. Uh, one yeah. of my favorite moments, Nadine comes up to Ed and, and apologizes for everything that she put him through and, and tells him, you know, it's okay. Go, go, go to Norma and, and tell her you love her. I know you do. I've known my whole life and, and I've, I've stayed with you anyway. And, and so he goes and, and Big Ed gets the girl and, and there are all these little details like that that are, that are great. We're introduced to Bobby and Shelley's daughter. Uh, turns out Bobby and Shelley aren't together, which is is a very David Lynch, da- very David Lynch way to wrap that up. Um, yeah, well, they're, they're not together, but they have a daughter who's dating uh, the guy from Get Out or Banshee from First Class, and he he goes for a job interview with Mike Nadine's ex boyfriend, uh, which is like I think it's his only appearance in the yeah, show. Yeah, that's it. It was just there for him to show up. Yeah, he, he just goes, this is literally the worst resume that I have ever seen. Uh, it would have been better if you came in here with nothing instead. And that guy, that actor, I don't know his name. He is the greasiest man on the planet. <laughs> Call him something or other, I think. <laughs> he is so greasy. And he plays a, you know, a coked out lunatic in the, in the show. Yeah. Um, uh, there's the, the trailer park analogy I gave, I uh, talked about last week on the, on the film show where we're, we don't really see the trailer park in Twin Peaks. Everything in Twin Peaks looks sort of nice and clean, and but then when we get to the anti Twin Peaks and Fire Walk with Me, we do see a, a seedy trailer park in another town, and then right. the guy who owns that trailer park also turns up in Twin Peaks, yeah. which is nice. Yeah, it's great. Uh, well, I say it's nice. A little kid does get hit with a car. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> and he witnesses his soul go to heaven. But it's it's nice to see. Uh, oh. Oh, I'm not gonna remember his name, and I love him. Um, I mean, he, he's in he's in Alien. He's a huge like B movie actor. Uh, everyone loves him. He died a few years ago too. Uh, uh, oh, it's gonna go. Uh, Harry Harry Dean Stanton. That's his name. Yeah, great um, guy. So so that happens, and now we're we're gonna shift focus a little bit. Uh, also, um, Bobby's father, uh, Briggs. Um, Briggs is dead. He's dead, and because he got sucked into the Black Lodge at the end of um, season two. No, it happened between seasons because he was back. Um, yeah, he, he he comes back and he gives Bobby that whole spiel about how he had a dream, <laughs> and just goes on for twenty minutes, and then Bobby breaks down and cries, and that's the last time we ever see him. Right, and then we we sort of shift focus with him. Um, his body shows up, but he hasn't aged any. His head has just been decapitated, uh, and they find his body. In the the house of the woman who, uh, with the woman's head, who Shaggy from Scooby Doo was having an affair on his wife with. Yes, uh, um, which is probably the saddest storyline. Yes, Matthew Lillard's storyline gets me every time. But so apparently, we'll, we'll just kind of break this down and then we'll go into episode eight. So uh, Matthew Lillard's character, whose name I can't remember, he's the principal of the elementary school, and he gets really into this this Black Lodge mythology that he starts reading about. Um, he summons Agent Briggs somehow, uh, him and this woman who I think was the librarian at the school who was also interested in it. Um, they both summon him and then the next day she winds up dead and he's framed for her murder. And then they, the, 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 the Blue Roses team, as they're tracing down loose ends, uh, finds him and, and talks about his story and then his head explodes. So that's done. That's out of the way. (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't need to talk about it again the show really doesn't uh right um that that's just there to inter- to reintroduce us to to briggs and and show that he's I now just like the black lodge and everything just kind of show that I, I always took it as like the influence of twin peaks is spreading because bob's been out and about yeah i could see that uh plus then then we get to see his head floating in the white lodge with a cgi mouth because he passed away several years back um right <laughs> <laughs> So let's get on to episode eight and, and let's just talk about it. Episode eight is um, the most Lynchian episode of the whole series. Uh, and I know it, you slept through it the first time. Did you also sleep it, through it the second time? Uh, no, I don't think I did. I can't remember the ending, but I didn't sleep through it, I don't think. It, it's the most abstract that I think the show's ever gotten. Uh, well, it's definitely the most abstract the show's ever gotten. It's just... 
it's a full hour that doesn't it doesn't have any real life like Twin Peaks in or uh, it, well it uh, opens with Mr. C getting shot right that that's about it really um, right it opens with, with that, it's just abstract on abstract on abstract it, it goes to a flashback um of the 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 first nuclear test in America the first nuclear bomb test I guess in the world I, I say in America but um, it's the first nuclear bomb test, and then we sort of zoom in to the nuke, uh, and the whole episode's in black and white, except for these beautiful colors inside uh, of this nuke. It's an absolutely gorgeous episode, uh, and we sort of, you know, we, we, we go inside of the explosion, and we explore that a little bit, and then we cut to outer space. Where the giant and the arm are watching this nuclear explosion. Yes. And Judy's there. And Judy's there, yes. And she's and, vomiting up and children. She vomits up, she vomits up Bob and Mike and Laura, I think. No, Laura comes later. Right, Laura comes later then. Uh, yeah, she vomits up Bob and Mike, and it's like she well, she vomits up these orbs and in them are Bob and Mike. Like you can see their faces. She, uh, yes. She she vomits up her eggs. <laughs> which crash in Nevada. Which, yeah, which crash in Nevada, uh, and and then <laughs> some frog, so... some frogs with wings like like cockroach frogs come out yeah. of the eggs. <laughs> yes, they do. And then and then it switches to to. Is that when we get to the woodsman? Yes. Now it's the greatest zombie movie ever made. The most horrifying zombie movie you've ever seen because the woodsmen start coming out and the woodsmen are basically just. I guess Judy's servants or Bob's servants, someone's servants, uh, but they're essentially zombies and they start attacking people. And then we cut to this little preteen couple who are walking home from a dance and they're just walking home and talking. And according to the um, novelization of this, that woman was Laura Palmer's mother. Um, it's left somewhat ambiguous in the actual episode, but according to the novelization of the series, that is Laura Palmer's mother. Um, and that's the official novelization. So it, it could be said that that's Laura Palmer's mother. She goes into her house. He goes home. They kiss a little bit. A little peck. One of the woodsmen, uh, they just go around killing people, basically. He brereaks into a radio station. Yeah, that's the Abraham Lincoln one, right? Yes. That he's, he's played by yeah, the actor who, who only ever plays Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> correct. Um yeah, he he's he's basically only ever played Abraham Lincoln and things. He's been in some other stuff uh, in little bit parts. So he breaks into this this radio station and he kills the DJ, which was horrifying for me because that's what I do for a living. And um, he just squeezes his head. <laughs> right, <laughs> he just squeezes his head until it explodes. Um, and then uh. he starts talking to the mic and he gives this speech that basically hypnotizes people into falling asleep. Apparently. Uh, oh, uh, Josh, we forgot about the convenience store. Do we have to talk about the convenience store? Yeah, we got to talk about the convenience store. Um, it's the most boring thing that I've seen. I think that was the part that genuinely put me to sleep. Yeah, yeah. the The explosion uh, is somewhat boring because they hold on it for a long time, but at least it's pretty. The convenience well, yeah, it, store. Visually, it's like it's it it, it helped me because it was visually really interesting and it's a great nuclear explosion. Um, and like the music too is fantastic. It's um I can't remember what the name of it is, but it's um it, it was written um as a tribute to like Hiroshima victims, I think. Yes. Um yeah. I can't uh, remember what it's called. But yeah, so that it, it, it plays through and it's it's gorgeous. And then we cut to the convenience store, which is created amidst this explosion, and the woodsmen start walking around in that, and that's the creation of the woodsmen. It's their the their yeah, place it, of that goes on for it feels like 20 minutes and I, it's just nothing. I genuinely think it was like 10. Like 10 it, minutes. I, it, it's very likely, but it's just like it's sped up and they kind of walk around and then they will go inside and then they come back and they walk around and they will go inside and it's just that on repeat over and over and over again. And it's... Uh, um, I, it's I like David Lynch's stuff, but that's that was kind of a bit too much for me. Yeah, same. Um, um, yeah. And it starts flashing. It's the convenience store that Philip Jeffries mentions in... Fire walk with me, as well as there's a woodsman there. We actually get to see the inside of it. Yeah, there. you see uh, 
proto woodsman, I suppose you'd call it. Right. Um, they're just hanging out in the convenience store on the weirdest date you've ever been on. Um, there's a Formica table. Green is its color. And then... Um, the series, which is nice. Right, yeah. Um, and then... He's so, half age one bit. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so then... So then the woodsmen then, give the speech that makes people fall asleep, and then... Uh, got an item. Right. Well, it's uh, what, what is it? The 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 water in the well. The white horse drink up and and be filled or something along those lines. Um, it sounds like it sounds like a hocus pocus. Line. <laughs> yes, genuinely. Um, uh, so, so so the the little girl who was listening falls asleep, and, and then, then the monks go into her room, uh, and they crawl inside her mouth, and then it ends. One of them crawls inside her mouth, and then it ends. Right, and then yeah, and then it switches to Nine Inch Nails playing at the Roadhouse. Yes, and the, the episode ends, and Dave Lynch goes, "There you go, that's a wrap, everybody." <laughs> yeah, it is really abstract, and I I know you you weren't as much of a fan of it. Uh, I I like it for the most part. Like like I say, the convenience store bits a little bit too much for me to just touch too far, but it's mostly pretty fun and it's got some of the most interesting visuals i've really seen in a long time i, I would agree there i it was gorgeous i will i will give it that but it, it just kind of um didn't capture me um it, like i said it's so gorgeous they were playing it in movie theaters at the time when this came out um mm, yeah, yeah. which is really neat uh, but like i said it, a it bit too it's much so for me well, in terms of relating to the show because i like everything we said just then doesn't seem to make sense but it all it's essentially just kind of an origin story, and it's like, hey, so this is how Twin Peaks, this is how the Black Culture was made, this is how Twin Peaks and the evil within Twin Peaks kind of came to be. Uh, and it's a nice little metaphor, I guess, for like, oh, the evil in Twin Peaks came from the evil of man. Yes, uh, but you could have done that in five minutes, and they took I, an yeah, hour. That That's my thing with it. it, it but it is visually great, and it... it it's the episode that slowed me down a little bit, but then I just went to the next episode and the next episode's normal. So, um, uh, well, the, the next episode is just like, that's, uh, that's kind of more Mr. C stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's kind of, again, it's more, I, that's when you find out about major books, right? Where they're like, Oh yeah, this is some dude who disappeared 20 years ago. I think so. And, and the second half of the season is sort of shifts a bit from the first half. Right. Well, the We're, first half is very much kind of catch up and set up. Right. Exactly. Absolutely, just pay off. Right, and, and, and that's where we sort of kind of keep unraveling the stuff with the FBI. Um, Dougie Jones is becoming more and more successful in his thing, and, and he's figuring out more and more stuff. He he dis he rediscovers coffee and and the thumbs up, um, and, and a lot of little little details like that happen. Um, but. But we also find out a whole lot more about Mr. C. We 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 figure out how he um, created that that room where the guy was watching the big black box where Judy killed him. We 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 learn a little more about Judy and where she came from. Yeah. At, yeah. Um, oh, we we forgot to mention about Jerry Horn and what he's up to nowadays. Oh yeah. So that's another little subplot that just kind of plays throughout the series. Jerry Horn. Um, now lives <laughs> he lives in the woods because he got so high he got lost there. And he's just a hippie with a beard. And it's incredible. Um, it's great. And Ben Horn seems to have cleaned up a lot. Um, he yeah, doesn't... Yeah, he's really living his life. Uh, he's just kind of... He's not even a shady businessman now. He's just kind of a businessman who operates his hotel. Which makes sense, given his arc in season two of the show. Um, season two of the show, he you know he, he sort of redeemed himself, I guess. And now here he is just living his life. We're also in the second half of the season introduced to Audrey Horn, um, right, yeah. which gives a little leeway to the theory that I have settled on as my theory for what this show means, <laughs> which it's, it's a shame you have to have a, I guess it's not a shame. It's pretty great, but there's, you have to have a theory to make sense of the, of the series. It's great that the show never, ever confirms anything out, right? Right. So we're introduced to Audrey Horn, who is one of the better characters from the series, um, and she basically never leaves her house until she finally does in the last episode she's in. And, um, her husband is a, uh, he's either a lawyer or a writer. 
I, I never knew. Um. I think he's a writer. Um, I'm pretty sure he's an author. Uh, and, and he keeps saying things along the lines of, I'll write you out of this or, or whatever. And she just really wants her coat. She really <laughs> wants him to put on her coat. Um, and Wait, so she, she, so she, well, she wakes up pregnant from after the bank explosion. Does she? Is she pregnant? Yeah, I, I, I thought she like she woke up finding out she was pregnant. I don't remember that at all. Maybe you're right. I don't know. Well, I, I was pretty sure that was a thing. Uh, like she woke, she woke up, and then everyone tried to help her out, being like, "Hey, you shouldn't be a single mother." And she turned them all away. And then I think she, like, when when Richard, her horrible, horrible, horrible son, was like ten, that's when she got married. I don't remember the stuff about her son at all, but I could have fallen asleep. Um, <laughs> genuinely, I could have, and I'm probably just missing that. I just remember the conversation between her and her tiny, tiny short husband. Um, uh, <laughs> where, and, and this is interesting because I do want to note this because they, the the conversation they're having is that they're looking for Billy. Yes, and who Audrey's been cheating on. She's with. been cheating on her husband with, with this guy named Billy. And she wants to go to the roadhouse to look for him. She's trying to convince her husband to leave, who keeps saying, we can't leave. And then finally, when it's time to leave, now she's hesitant, but she goes anyway. They go to the roadhouse, and then Audrey's dance starts playing at the roadhouse. Um, and she gets up and starts dancing, and all eyes are on her. And then things kind of go back to CD Twin Peaks again, and people get in a bar fight. And then it cuts to her in an all-white room staring at herself in a mirror. Mm. Which is super weird and super out there, but it does, I guess we'll talk about theories at, at this point and we'll tie it into the finale when we get there. We got about 10 minutes left on this thing, um, which is not enough time oh. to talk about this, but no. <laughs> uh, so, so my favorite theory I've heard about this, about the return is that um, this, the specific Audrey Horn stuff is is not act, doesn't actually take place in the the Twin Peaks world. Instead, it takes place in the real world, and that is the actress coming to realization that she is not um, she's not a star anymore. She's not a, a a young star with all eyes on her, with her whole career ahead of her. She's now a middle aged woman who barely has a career. Uh, that's why her husband keeps saying, you know, I'll write you out of this story. Um, that's so her at the end in the white room is not. Audrey Horn, that's the actress who plays her coming to that realization. I like that. It, it's sad, but it's also kind of neat. Yeah, it's it's really neat. And and the thing that sells me on it the most is Billy, specifically. Because, because well, because Billy Zane is the actor right. who played um, her love interest in the original show. But they didn't use his name from the show. They used the actual actor's name as opposed to using his name from the series. Uh, and that's what sold me on that theory specifically um, for, for the Audrey Horn stuff, which is super fascinating. I don't know that it's true or not. Um, I know David Lynch did threaten to write her out of the series. And, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he did. They had a lot of controversy. They didn't really get along. He threatened to write her out of the series and then he didn't put her in uh fire walk with me, even though she was, oh, yeah. she would have been there. Um, she was friends with, uh, well, not friends. She, she knew of and was acquaintances with Laura Palmer. Right. Exactly. She went to the high school. They could have just cut to a scene of her, but they didn't. Um, she has as much reason to be in there as James does. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, no, uh, James and Laura were dating, so... <laughs> maybe it's just my hate for James being yeah. too cool. Uh, but, the yeah, we might as well... We've got 10 minutes to wrap up about half a season. So, to to the speed round, so to speak. So, Coop goes into... Dougie goes into a coma. Uh, because, because he... he was, <laughs> because he shocks himself with a fork in a socket. He sticks a fork in a light socket. And we didn't even get to all the great Dougie Jones stuff. You just kind of have to watch it for that. Oh, absolutely. Like, it, it, it's phenomenal. Uh, so, so Dougie Jones goes into a coma. And we're in, like, the last two or three episodes here. Dougie yeah, Jones... It, I think episode, like, it's two episodes before the finale. Right. When he wakes up from his coma, 
he is no longer Dougie Jones. He is the FBI. In the best line I've ever heard. It's it's so incredible. He wakes up and it's like Coop didn't skip a beat. I mean, it's classic Twin Peaks agent, special agent Dale Cooper. He stands up. He takes all the things off of him. He's talking to the nurse and he says, you'll find that all of my vitals are spot on perfect. If you just look and, and she's like, oh, yeah, you are. Yeah, I guess you can leave. And so he he leaves and he sets up all his plan that he's had 25 years now to lay out. And he starts setting up his plan and the FBI's on his way. And the his bo- Dougie Jones boss turns to him and says, Dougie, what do we do about the FBI? And he just turns to him and he says, I am the FBI. And then he leaves and he pulls all these favors that Dougie Jones has collected throughout the series, which is also great that Dougie Jones was just collecting. Yeah, it, all like, it, it all comes together, essentially. It Mr. Magoo's itself together. And that's when we get to, um, that's an episode, right? And then we get to, um, not technically the finale, but I'm going to call it the first finale. It's it's a two-parter. Right. And and it's really interesting the way that they do it, because Bob appears as an orb, and this British guy that James meets, James is there for the finale, which is awesome, (laughs) because he's so cool. (laughs) Um, We meet this British guy who, who, who was told a few months earlier that his destiny was in Twin Peaks. And so Cooper shows up in Twin Peaks and everything kind of falls into place. And then there's this whole battle in inside of the sheriff's department. And this British guy just punches Bob to death. And that's where the episode ends. Yeah. And that, that's, that, that, that's it. That's what I would call the normal finale of the show. You can stop right there and you have a nice conclusion to Twin Peaks. Yeah, you've got, you've got oh, uh, Bob is defeated. Coop's back and everyone, uh, Mr. C is dead. Everyone lives happily ever after, essentially. Lucy, by the way, kills Mr. C, which is my favorite part. I oh, love we, didn't even, we didn't even talk about Michael Sarah. Oh, Michael Sarah plays Lucy and Andy's son. That's Body. all you needed to know. That's all you needed to know. Um, uh, Lucy yeah, is so horribly that, that scared happened. of cell phones, too, by the way. <laughs> Terribly. She's, she's just as great now. So is Andy. Um, uh, but yeah, so that, that all happens. And then that's like the Mark Frost finale. And right. then the, uh, the episode after is the David Lynch finale. Where, so half the episode is, is Cooper and Diane driving. Yeah, half the episode is Cooper and Diane driving. And then they spend the night together in the motel. He wakes up with a note from Linda, I think it says. Well, we should uh, note that it's the most horribly uncomfortable sex scene since Fire Walk With Me. I, I, just, I was just going to skip over it because I, I don't... Is there, there's no, no, I'm not going to, no. There's uh, no dialogue. There's, there's, there's barely any sound. You can tell neither of them want to be doing what they're doing. I, I mean, they dated for a while. Right. And it's just, it's so awkward. Um, <laughs> it's, but yeah. It's like, but the, well, I think the reason it's, I think it's awkward on purpose. I don't think it's awkward like it, in real it, life. It, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that they, like, they seem very professional people and they both seem to love David Lynch. Right. Uh, um, well, it seems to, to, to be their way of summoning Judy. Right. But Judy, is they, is, they say like this negative force, just this, whose and their actual name is like Jowdy or something <laughs> like that. Right. Okay. We've got, we've got, <laughs> we've got two minutes to wrap up this finale. Josh, go. <laughs> okay. So that happens. Coop wakes up. He goes to a diner. He essentially kills three cowboys. He then notices that one of the waitresses at Judy's diner is uh, an exact replica of Laura Palmer. So he takes her to Twin Peaks, to her old house. And it is that point where he knocks on the door and he finds that it's owned by someone who isn't Mrs. Palmer, who is actually still alive. Okay, then- wait, 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 wait. It should be noted, uh, and we'll talk about this I- I- in a moment. The The woman who, the a- quote-unquote actress who owns that house is the woman who owns that house in real life. She comes to the door. She's not an actress. That's the actual person who physically owns the Laura Palmer house in real life. Go. At that point, she, it, it's, <laughs> Cooper asks what year it is, and then they hear Laura's mom calling her name and then the house goes out and then it closes and that's it. We oh no. And then Laura's talking to Cooper in the black room again. Well, that's we, it. We didn't, we didn't go to the black and white stuff from where, where Cooper goes back to oh, the yeah. fire walk with he, me. He saves Laura Palmer's life essentially. Uh, saves Laura Palmer's life, but then she disappears. And then that's when Cooper wakes up. Okay. Right. That's the finale and, of the show. That's the finale of the show. There's a lot of theories going around. Uh, like the one you said about it being in real life. 
uh, there's another one that's it, there's a theory that's like it's all a dream, uh, which yeah, I guess is a cop out, but I could also see it. Uh, I saw one which is something like when everything from when Cooper wakes up after having sex with uh, Diane, that's all a dream that's incited by Judy to give him some kind of sense of closure and so she can enact her plan. Mm. Or so that she can keep living and doesn't have to die. That's interesting. I uh, uh, I kind of like that. That's why you have like Judy's diner, right? I so so the one that I buy the most is that that whole final sequence where Coop wakes up and he goes and 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 he goes to Judy's diner. All of that stuff takes place in the real world, not in the Twin Peaks world, um, which I think is. The only real proof you have of that is that the 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 woman who owns that house is the real woman who owns the house, not um, not like an actress or anything. Not like an actress or anything. It's just the actual person, but that could have been just David Lynch thanking her for letting them use her house. But with the, the the name the name of the person is Carrie Page, who is the woman that uh, Laura delivers food to in season one, I think. Right, which that that. Adds the idea that maybe they went back in time too far, but I... Why he's asking what year it is. Right. Uh, it's David Lynch, and here's the thing. You will never be able to get an answer on this. But this right. Is... Well, the stuff, like I said, there there are a lot of details that I think play into the idea that it's a real world, such as when you drive by the Double R Diner, it doesn't have the Twin Peaks sign on it. It's got the actual sign from the real company on it. Um, none of the stuff looks very Twin Peaks. It looks more like a real town as opposed to the way Twin Peaks is presented in the series. Like I said, that's just the theory that I buy into, but it's all really complicated and I don't really understand any of it. Um, which is kind of the fun. <laughs> but that, yeah, that's like, that's half the fun of Twin Peaks is trying to guess what it means and then giving it your own meaning. Right, exactly. I mean, you can take and, and, and make, I mean, ultimately it's, it's good versus evil, uh, especially the original series. Um, but I don't know. It's great. I, I, like I said, Twin Peaks, the return is, is probably my favorite Twin Peaks. We didn't even talk about the arm wrestling scene, man. You just need to watch it. If you, if you haven't seen it and you watch through this, yeah, sure. I mean, it's we'll, been, we'll, we'll probably end up mentioning it again on future podcasts, but it's, it's, it's a spectacle to be seen. And Absolutely. Uh, there will never ever be anything quite like Twin Peaks. No. I mean, until David Lynch's Netflix series comes out. Right. And then then you maybe have something. You may have another part of Twin Peaks. I, I would be surprised. But, all right, Josh, we did it. We described all of Twin Peaks, the return, in an hour. Uh, yeah, we skipped over, like, half the things. But... Yeah, we didn't, we didn't even scratch the surface. <laughs> but either way, uh, thank you very much for joining us for the last hour. And uh, we hope you have a nice day. And if you haven't, I would really, 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 really recommend Twin Peaks. It's a fantastic show, and you will get so much enjoyment out of it. Yeah, no matter where you're listening, thanks for listening. If you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, any of the the, the podcast platforms, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much. Uh, and I guess we will see you next week.